Welcome to all those here, and welcome to those who are joining us uh, over the internet, whether that be morning or evening or the middle of the night. Uh, welcome to this space. We're glad you're here to worship with us. We continue on now in our series through uh, the book of Ephesians with the, the themed title of Strangers No More, and we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 4 this week with the, the sermon title, the, the tantalizing sermon title of Walking in Love Through Anger. So we will uh, come together and share this space and learn about God's love, but also about uh, the justice that is part of God's love. And we experience that sometimes in our own hearts and in God as anger. So we look forward to hearing more about that as we worship together. Welcome to Hively Avenue Mennonite Church. Um, for those of you that have uh, printed off your bulletin or have it there digitally, we welcome you to open that. We have announcements in the, the middle of it. I won't address all of them, but I'll bring a few to the fore here. Uh, please check out the children's time that Elia recorded earlier and will be available uh, on our website. Also, for our youth, Snacks and Scripture will be tomorrow, or depending on when you're watching this, maybe today. Um, but also be checking your, your text messages as we're going to be kind of taking a little survey on uh, maybe what folks would like to do this summer. We've noticed participation gets a little choppier during the summertime, so we're trying to get a little bit of a feel for uh, what you guys are looking for this summer in terms of engagement and uh, fellowship time together. Also note that this next week is Central District Conference uh, annual meeting on Saturday, so there's some information in there about that as well. And probably most importantly, next Sunday, don't look for recordings, uh, at least not on Saturday, because we will be worshiping together on Sunday morning uh, in the back beginning at 10 o'clock here at Hively Avenue Church. So uh, please come join us next Sunday here. For the rest of the announcements, please check those out in the bulletin online. And with that aside, let us join together in our call of worship, which is also printed in the bulletin. So please join as we uh, sort of read through and recite together this Franciscan prayer. And not just Franciscan in the sense of um, from the, the people that came from uh, St. Francis and his way of being, but these were literally some of the words of St. Francis himself. So let us share in these together as we begin our time. Be praised, my Lord, for the gift of life, for changing dusk and dawn. For apples sweet, each face we meet, for touch and scent and song. Be praised, my Lord, for those who forgive others for love of thee. Be praised, Lord, for all thy creatures worshiping joyfully. With that, let us worship together this morning. Ed will be leading us um, in voices together. These should be printed in your bulletins. Uh, we begin with, with two of them, 111 and 409, so get both of those ready. And I would mention that notice in the, the first one, the 10,000 reasons, bless the Lord, uh, there is the line, you are rich in love and slow to anger. 
And again, with our theme, uh, this is saying something of God's love and his relationship to anger, but notice that God is slow to anger, but that there is still this, this justice, this, this yearning for setting things right. So let us worship together. Ed, thank you so much for leading us. Theme song 409, for we are strangers no more. Oh, no. 
our peace candle reflection this afternoon, this morning, comes from uh, our dear sister, Deb Kravitz, who couldn't be here today, so she uh, sent this to me, so I'll be reading this on her behalf. This is what Deb says. She says, I had a poster on my wall many years that read, the whole world is crazy with the exception of me and you. And frankly, I'm having my doubts about you. Do you ever get the urge to just go hide in the corner and let the world go spinning on its own? Saturday is Juneteenth. June is Pride Month for our LGBTQ friends. Our friends in blue just want to make it home at the end of their shift. There are allies and protesters on both sides. Blue lives matter, black lives matter. The chant goes on and on. African American mothers worry for their son's safety. Disagreements seem to get settled with a gunshot. While I try to keep up with the ever-changing definitions and the latest cause that I should be supporting, I just keep relying on Isaiah 26.3. He will keep you in perfect peace when your mind stays on him. And my favorite psalm, she says, 46.10, be still and know that I am God. We are all equal, all made in God's image, black, brown, yellow, and white, gay, and straight. We are all brothers and sisters. I think we need to pray for ears that truly listen. Under all the shouting and hatred is a still small voice just wanting to be heard and understood. I can't find the poem I'm thinking of, so I'll paraphrase, she says. If he stays in his corner and refuses to come out and meet in the middle, I just need to join him in his corner and wrap my arms around him. Pray for discernment. Pray for hearts to soften. We aren't only God's hands and feet. We are God's voice. The world needs peacemakers right now. In South Central Elkhart, in the projects, at work, at school, and even in our own families. Keep your focus on God. Speak love. Speak truth. Just speak up. Be who God has called his people to be. The world needs us. Please join me in the litany as it's printed in your bulletin. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today we light this candle as a reminder of our calling. In the spirit of this peace candle reflection, let us enter into a time of confession now. As we go through this confession, we will be uh, stopping after each phrase and we will be singing from Voices Together, page 792. Ed maybe has something to say. Could we have Crystal play it through once before you begin? Yes. We will have Crystal play it through once for us so that we get the, the rhythm and the, the words of it. So. God, we come before you and we confess. For the times we have lied to one another and the times we have been lied to. For the times we are laughed, we have laughed at another's pain and the times we have been laughed at. For the times we have betrayed a friend and the times we have been betrayed. For the times we have spoken when we should have remained silent 
and the times we have remained silent when we should have spoken. Here, please, these words of assurance. From all that is broken, let there be beauty. From what is torn, jagged, ripped, frayed, let there be not just mendings, but meetings unimagined. May the God in whom nothing is wasted gather up every scrap, every shred and shard, and make of them new paths doorways, and worlds. Our next song is a, a newer one as well, uh, but we encourage you to look at the video that has been included in the weekend emails. Uh, it gives a wonderful background for this song, the story behind it, uh, rooted in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, you'll notice that some of the lines are in Hebrew and in Arabic. We'll stick with the English today, um, but check out this video to hear the beautiful uh, Arabic and Hebrew as well. So, number 808. <laughs> Scripture readers today that will be Eric Fink and Elia Hess. Elia will be reading in Spanish. Eric will be reading in English. And this will be from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through chapter 5, verses 2. And then following, we welcome uh, Susanna up to share our sermon with us today. Blessings to you. And we look forward to maybe cuddling with Carissa while you're up here. Or maybe you'll preach with her on you. We'll, we'll see how it rolls. Okay, so I'll be reading from the uh, New Living Translation, um, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through, uh, chapter 4, starting with verse 25, until chapter 5 of verse 2. Stop telling lies, let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work, hard work, and then give your hands give your hands for a good hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to others who hear them. 
and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of the redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil be behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgive one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following his example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, pleasing to the aroma of God. I finish at chapter 5, verse 2. I'll be reading in Spanish from the New International Version. Y voy a leer de Efesios, uh, capítulo 4, versículos 25 hasta capítulo 5, versículo 2. Dice así. Por lo tanto, dejando la mentira, hable cada uno a su prójimo con la verdad. Porque todos somos miembros de un mismo cuerpo. Si se enojan, no pequen. Si permiten que el enojo les dure hasta la puesta del sol, ni den cabida al di diablo. El que robaba, que no robe más, sino que trabaje honorandamente con las manos para tener que compartir con los necesitados. Eviten toda conversación obscena. Por el contrario, que sus palabras contribuyan a la necesaria edificación y sean de bendición para quienes escuchan. No agravien al Espíritu Santo de Dios con el cual fueron sellados para el día de la redención. Abandonen toda amagura, ira y enojo, gritos y calumnias, y toda forma de, mal de malicia. Más bien, sean bondadosos y compasivos unos con otros, y perdónense mutuamente, así como Dios los perdonó a ustedes en Cristo. Por tanto, Imiten a Dios como hijos muy amados y lleven una vida de amor así como Cristo nos amó y se entregó para nosotros como ofrenda y sacrificio fragrante para Dios. La palabra de Dios. Gracias. I think we all have an anger story, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit of mine. As a child and a teenager, I was full of a quiet and almost invisible anger. From my first memories as a toddler, about the age of my daughter Gabby, to the age of 18, I experienced a parent's abuse as a witness to it and as its object. Now I could see from watching my three older siblings and my non-abusive parent that overt resistance in response to this violence was dangerous, and I chose silence as my own defense. I never yelled back at my parent. I never physically retaliated, not because that was inherently the right thing to do, but because that was my strategy. I was angry. I was angry because I knew that abuse was wrong. I was angry because I knew that the things that my parents said about me were untrue. I quietly but angrily anticipated the day when a full ride scholarship to college would mean my independence. Anger helped keep me alive because through it I lived the reality that no matter what happened to me, I had dignity and worth that belied my circumstances. My anger was a shield from what otherwise could have been a life-threatening or even life-ending situation. Anger was one of the ways that I claimed my strength and my dignity. So when I was 18 and I just finished my freshman year in college, I returned home for the summer and I'd had a little taste of living free from abuse. But back home, the abuse restarted. Finally, I remember thinking to myself in anger, this is the last time. I left home, and at a safe distance of about 600 miles, I called my abusive parent, whom I deeply love, and I said, 
your behavior is abusive. I can't tolerate it anymore. It will kill me, and I deserve to live. This was not an easy truth to tell, and it came with many repercussions I wasn't expecting, including rejection by my non-abusive parent and my sisters. And yet, telling that truth, no matter what the cost, resolved the anger inside of me. Speaking aloud what I knew I needed for wholeness and safety allowed me to live, to really live, without that anger defining everything else. I tell some of my own imperfect and broken story because our Ephesians passage speaks into this complicated reality of navigating truth and love and community. As Christian peacemakers, it's easy to jump to the end of the passage where the Pauline writer encourages the audience, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ has forgiven you. Yes, yes to all of this. But that's not where the passage begins, and we shouldn't start there either. When we encounter anger, either ourselves or somebody else's, we should not begin with forgiveness. Anger has something to tell us. It's sometimes even the gift that alerts us of wrong in this world. Our Ephesians passage for today falls just after the Pauline writer has finished telling us that walking in the way of Christ means total transformation. It's what feminist theologian Letty Russell calls a change of uniform. We're to take off our old humanity and put on a new humanity, in Greek, the kainos anthropos. Now for the sports fans out there, you might remember the controversy when LeBron James, my favorite athlete and secretly my longtime celebrity crush, left the Cleveland Cavaliers, the NBA team of his home city, for the Miami Heat. Can you imagine the stir it must have caused Cavaliers fans when they saw LeBron walk out on the court for the first time in his new Heat jersey? The uniform change of our new humanity is an even more dramatic transformation. We put on Christ himself when we follow in his footsteps. Now surprisingly, the very first thing that the writer talks about after introducing us to our new uniform of the kainos anthropos, the new humanity, is anger. It's not a question of if we're going to get angry, but when and how. And true enough, anger flares up often in our lives, sometimes for great reasons and sometimes for not so great reasons. As I was writing this sermon, after I'd just gotten our three little girls into bed, my next door neighbors were lighting firecrackers. Well, the inevitable happened and the loud popping woke up sweet baby Carissa and suddenly I was full of not so neighborly thoughts. <laughs> Anger shows up, sometimes unexpectedly, in all of our lives. So as people who are strangers no more and right up in each other's faces like family, the question about anger is how we integrate it into our journey of Christian discipleship. Ephesians lets us know that the beginning of this journey is speaking the truth to one another. The writer tells us, So then, putting away falsehood, let us all speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of each other. Real resolution of anger doesn't mean accepting lies or tolerating injustice. As Christians who live in community with one another, God calls us to honesty because the truth, the Gospel of John tells us, will set us free. Telling the truth to one another, even and especially the hard truths, can set each other free. We owe it to each other to work through our anger together as we grow as Christ followers. Even more surprisingly, in the very next verse, the author gives us a command. Be angry, but do not sin. Jesus, our sinless moral exemplar, was sometimes angry. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus becomes angry when tradition gets in the way of caring for people. This happens on a, the Sabbath, normally a holy day of rest, when he meets a man with a hand that he's unable to use. 
Of course, Jesus' inclination is towards healing, even though it's on the Sabbath. The authorities around Jesus are already mentally putting him on trial for breaking tradition. And their unwillingness to take seriously the pain of the man in front of them makes Jesus angry, Mark tells us. Now, if anybody's anger can be regarded as good and holy, it's Jesus's. Jesus models anger for us as a way for us to speak the truth in love for one another. But we are not Jesus, and sometimes our anger spirals out of control and inflicts harm even when its origin makes complete sense. Be angry, but do not sin, Ephesians tells us. This is actually a quote from the Greek version of Psalm 4. That psalm gives us an idea of how we can have righteous anger without letting it get out of control. Now, this psalm is about asking God for help in the midst of trial. God is named as the one who hears when we, calls for, when we call for help. We share the psalmist's belief in that God who is both merciful and just, who works out his will on earth. We don't have to go to the point of sin when we're angry, because even when we feel ignored, even when we feel disrespected, God is still attentive to us. God knows the reasons for our anger and takes our pain seriously. Knowing that God cares for us in this way opens up the possibility that God carries our pain alongside us. We are not alone in anger. And that means that maybe part of anger, doing anger well means that we don't have to carry it forever. Our Ephesians reading directs us, don't let the sun go down on your anger. When I was a child, I took this very literally, and I thought that if I was still angry at somebody by the time I turned off my light at night, I was doing something wrong. But most commentators take this verse to mean that carrying anger indefinitely isn't wise. Now, on the other hand, resolving anger too quickly isn't a great idea either. What I've learned about myself as an introvert and an internal processor is that usually I need a good deal of time alone before I know how I want to resolve a conflict. Otherwise, I usually, actually inevitably, end up saying or doing something that I regret later. But there comes a point where holding on to anger serves an end that's damaging to us as the person who's been wronged. Anger can become our identity in a way that defines and harms us. I understand the pull of holding on to anger. In Bessel van der Kolk's powerful book about trauma, The Body Keeps the Score, he writes about how certain war veterans he worked with in his psychiatry practice unconsciously held on to their trauma symptoms so that they would be a living memorial to those who had died in the war. The way that they experienced their trauma, they believed that if they, in their bodies, weren't holding on to the memories of those they'd lost, their loved ones would be forgotten. And I think sometimes we treat our anger like this too. We become living memorials to the injustices we have faced, holding on to anger out of fear that if we don't retain it, the wrongs we've faced will matter to no one. We keep fighting our own battles long after the combatants have disappeared. There is good reason to keep moving in our anger journeys and not let anger become the defining factor in our lives. Ephesians warns us that staying angry too long can make room for the devil. Now, anger isn't inherently bad and can be a valuable signpost that we or somebody else has been wronged. But without careful tending, anger can invite in the shadows. What began as a rightful response to wrong can end with a wrong ruling our lives. And so Ephesians gives us a list of what to avoid when we're angry to keep us away from the dominion of sin. Even as we're angry, we're to avoid bitterness, cruel outbursts, and malicious talk. When we're hurt and mad, all of these things are understandable and relatable responses to our situation. But at the same time, it's possible to take those wrongs seriously, to be angry well, and still practice the way of Jesus. We can resist the wrong without our anger changing who we are inside. The invitation of Ephesians is to move forward in our anger journeys before the sun goes down in our lives. The only way that I've learned to do this 
is having a trust that God cares about the wrong that has happened to us. And this is the same trust that the psalmist expresses in Psalm 4. Thankfully, Ephesians teaches us that human interactions matter to God profoundly. The writer tells us to take care with the words we use, to speak only what builds up and gives life, because doing otherwise grieves the Holy Spirit. The pain that we're dealt and the pain that we deal matters to God so intimately that it pains the spirit when one of God's children is wronged. And it's in that knowledge that we can safely begin to lay down some of our own pain, some of our own anger. It's at that point of laying down our anger that forgiveness begins. Forgiveness can be a disorienting experience. The fact that we're not mad anymore can be frightening because it can feel like we've surrendered our right to justice. But that's not what forgiveness means. The absence of anger and the presence of peace and joy in its place does not mean that we've sur surrendered our right to justice or forgotten the wrong. Instead, it means that the hurt was so great and our cause was so just that we could not resolve it on our own, but needed God's intervention. We can safely surrender our anger to a higher power, our God, in the confidence that the Lord is the one who defends the vulnerable and uplifts the cause of the wrong. Only the justice of God, not the anger we hold, can ultimately bring the righteousness we long for into our lives and into the world. Forgiveness is hard and scary and painful. It's also a concept that's often abused to further marginalize those who are experiencing power-based violence. But I am confident that forgiveness does not mean an absence of accountability, but rather a refusal to let even the most just anger define our lives. Forgiveness and holding people accountable to the truth go hand in hand. For me, the deepest experiences of forgiveness I've had have always involved speaking the truth first in the way that Ephesians models. Now, I said at the beginning that I thought that my anger at injustices kept me sane, kept me alive, because through it I knew who I was, that I had dignity. But as I've walked through this Ephesians passage, I've wondered if that was fully true. In the end, it was not my anger towards my parents that preserved me. Once I'd reached safety and wellness, when I laid down my anger to my parents, I still had dignity, and in my estimation anyway, my sanity. As justified as my anger was, letting me know that I deserved better than abuse, and as much as it's covered under Ephesians' command, be angry, it was never anger that gave me the strength or dignity that I always knew I had. That came from the justice of God. And so when my position of safety and accountability made it possible for me to forgive, the absence of anger didn't mean my dignity slipped away. Instead, the anger I had now rests in the strong and gentle and just hands of my heavenly Father whose perfect justice means that I never experienced any violence without God's lament and condemnation of it. Our anger is part of the journey, part of our calling, and yet just a sliver of the justice of God. Ephesians commands us to be angry, and yet also urges us to work towards a point of forgiveness. I understand that forgiveness as a trust in the justice of God working itself out in the world rather than my own retributive wrath as the ultimate healer of wrong. Stepping away from justified anger is hard and vulnerable and can feel like surrendering the only dignity we ever had. But our true dignity comes not from the anger that we've carried, but from our identity as beloved children of God. When we forgive, we surrender the power of our own anger, but we step into a different power, the justice that comes when we're able to put our whole selves, including all of our thoughts and emotions, in the hands of God. As forgiven and forgiving people, we become, Ephesians tells us, imitators of God. 
imitators of the God who works out justice, imitators of the God who is merciful, imitators of the God who brings together justice and mercy as the two beams of the cross. When we forgive, when we place our anger in the hands of God, we powerfully bear God's image as those who are empowered to hold together justice and mercy. Friends, we are all walking our own anger journeys. And as we do, when may we know that God's power goes with us and within us. It is stronger than the forces of evil, more tender than the embrace of the most loving parent, more just than our own retribution. This power, carried out in love, is what defines who we are. And with that gift, we are free to be angry and free to forgive and free to grow into all that God imagines for us. With that power at our backs, giving us dignity and strength and even peace, even as we walk through anger, we can do as Ephesians exhorts us. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Our response to him is number 790 in Voices Together. How can we be silent? Let's pray together. God of grace and God of glory, God who in scripture voices both your deep love for us and that expresses your feelings of anger, help us not to be silent, to speak truth and truth in love. You call us to be, no, to be strangers no more, 
But that's hard work. Sometimes we tick each other's tick each other off. Sometimes, sometimes over trivial things. Sometimes because with you we see injustice. Move in our hearts. Help us to learn to be both truthful and loving, to be angry, but not to be drawn away from love either. Being strangers no more is complicated, Lord. Teach us what our anger has to tell us and teach us how to work through it and walk with each other through those times. May that result in a world and in a community, a beloved community, that knows your presence more fully and that sees your spirit at work. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go out, not afraid to be angry, but knowing that our God of love will work through that and work through us by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Thank you.